So it's Friday, so it's time for poets. Some of us know that as push off early tomorrow's Saturday. But in this context, it's the perioperative enhancement team. Inspired by Dr. Sol Aronson and the team at Duke, a selection of clips to get us thinking about the next steps in providing world-class perioperative care. You'll find the full lectures in our back catalogue, or join us at the upcoming perioperative practicum for expert discussions, business case tips, and hands-on workshops. Go to www.edpom.org and look for our international programme of perioperative practicums. Top Ed Talk. So our first speaker speaking to the subject in 15 minutes or less of perioperative medicine is population health. Sol, over to you, buddy. Thank you. So the question that I am going to hopefully ask us to ask ourselves is, uh, is perioperative medicine population health? I hope we own that answer by the end of this sort of discussion. A few disclosures that I wish to share with you. And then I want to begin by saying... We've been lucky, all of us who have been privileged to work in that perioperative space over the last many years, decades, have been lucky. Unfortunately, those days are numbered, and and depending on what zip code we live in, um, either sooner or later. I think success is a lousy teacher. It seduces smart people into thinking they can't lose. That was a quote by Bill Gates, and I think it really underscores so much of what we today in healthcare have to consider about our transition. We all know these data. Unless you've been living in a cave or sleeping underneath a rock, I don't think any of these data should come as a surprise to you. But just to sort of set, if you will, the foundation of this lecture and the rationale for our urgency of thinking about who we are and what we are doing, obviously the cost of healthcare has exponentially grown faster than the cost of just worldwide inflation. And the attribution of that is almost equally, if you will, weighted between prescription job costs as well as hospital costs as well as professional costs. But it certainly is escalating at a rate that is much, much exceeding the normal inflation rate. We're spending about $3.5 trillion a year in this country today on health care. And yet there still is this disproportionality of fee-for-service versus Uh, if you will, manage care. And we're so much still weighted to a fee-for-service world. And so that sense of urgency just hasn't really hit home in the way that it needs to. And yet when we hit that edge of the cliff, we're going to fall very, very quickly. And so though we do need to know that there's a steady creep of ACOs and accountable care kind of management within our population, it is true that so many of us are still kind of living with our head in the sand and underneath the rock. That day will change quickly. So what is perioperative medicine? Mike Grocott, I think, quoted this a while ago, and it remains just one of, I think, the most thoroughly good definitions. Perioperative medicine describes the practice of patient-centered, multidisciplinary, and integrated medical care of patients for the moment of contemplation, contemplation of surgery until full recovery. Whereas population health has been described many ways by many people, this is probably one of the earliest and, and if you will, almost original definitions, the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within the group. So is perioperative medicine population health? So population health is sort of that pinnacle of a number of behaviors and processes and actions that we all ascribe to, to reduce costs and, and improve our quality or improve the value of the, what we do in healthcare, to enhance the experience of the providers, to, of course, enhance the care of the patient as a consequence of that, and to do it within a population health framework. So how does Perioperative medicine contribute to that is the question that we have to ask ourselves because we need to know that we are contributing to the value proposition. If we don't know that and we cannot define that, then we have no value. So it's really important for us to understand it in that context. A few, uh, if you will, foundational facts. Right now, of the three and a half or three point three trillion dollars that we spend on healthcare, a significant portion of that is attributable to just unnecessary care or wasteful care or uncoordinated care. And what we can do as providers within that perioperative space as a contribution to the continuum of population health really has to be described in the context of what we're doing to this very important number because we need to bend this curve or we will not survive. In our institutions as individual providers, we will not survive. 
An interesting article was published, I don't know how many of you saw it, a couple weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal. It was an article that described the cost of a total knee replacement. The Gunderson Clinic in upstate Wisconsin almost had a lean methodology, a a Toyota type of um, uh, analysis of what it costs to do a knee. And they they found that the cost of a knee was about seven to maybe $10,000. And they really broke it down almost by step by step, as you would a car on an assembly line, by each bolt and each nut as we gone through every minute. And they figured out that the cost could be attributable to each of those if you efforts. That's far different than the average cost of a knee throughout the average aggregate, if you will, analysis in our country, whereas right now we're looking at upwards of 40 or plus, depending on where you live and how you charge for that procedure. But I think the important part of this article was it went to the consumer, it went to the person who is now going to be the shopper, and they're going to determine, based on their savviness and their tools that are going to be available to them, where they're going to go to get the procedures done. And so if we are not aware of these data being distributed to our customers, we're fools, and we need to get our head out of that sand as well. We live in an interesting space in the perioperative world. We represent probably about a third of the admissions to a hospital, and yet we are accountable for over 50% of the cost. And so the the things that we do have great value, and the things that we can do from a behavioral modification also have great implications. And so what we decide we're going to do proactively to influence the cost of health care and how we can bend that curve are going to be very, very important. So I think we have to own the idea that perioperative medicine is a part of population health. This is an editorial that Mark McQuillan and I wrote a couple of years ago, and I think it was interesting in that before we actually published this together, I had to convince him that perioperative medicine was indeed a part of population health, worthy of talking about. He was willing to sort of listen but he was also inclined to dismiss it. And my argument to him was this, that although in that continuum of life, from birth to death, that population health cycle, perioperative medicine represents a disproportionately small sliver of that continuum. And yet, the value proposition that we could influence in that small, disproportionately small sliver is disproportionately great. And so what we do in that little world, in our little niche, is great compared to Uh, relatively speaking, everyone else. The other thing we talked about is there are essentially four kinds of tranches of people in a cohort, a biologic cohort of population. There's healthy people. That's the big base of the triangle. We know right now they're getting their care in retail consumer sites. People are going to Walmart to get their health care and their well checks. They're going to CVS. Whether or not we can continue to provide value in that population is some soul-searching that I think we in healthcare need to consider. The next tranche is people who have disease. They have chronic medical disease, but they're well-controlled. You probably wouldn't think of it. You probably thought I was an Olympic athlete. But I actually do have high blood pressure and hypercholesteremia. I take my pills every day. I'm well-managed. And I represent that other sort of population that there's trivial value proposition if you take care of me, but I'm otherwise pretty well-managed. The next tranche is the population with chronic comorbidities that are not well managed. And that's the population where there's a large value proposition. And we need to, as perioperative physicians, figure out how to touch them earlier in the curve and bend, if you will, their care so that we can influence population health value in our domain of perioperative medicine. The fourth tranche is people with complex special disease. By 2020... 25% of us in this room are going to have at least one chronic comorbidity, and um, I would say 50% are going to have at least one, and 25% of us are going to have two or more. So we continue to get older, and we continue to get sicker, and the population that we're going to see in a perioperative domain is going to continue to be reflective of that older and sicker population, and so they're going to come to the OR, and when they come to the OR, we have to be able to manage them. When they have a complication, on the average, and these are data that are already a few years old, it's about a $12,000 additional cost to anything that happens just from a surgical complication. So what do we do about that? I think the current surgical pathway is fundamentally flawed. 
If you think about it historically, back in the 80s, we all, you know, when I was growing up and many of you weren't born yet, we would have a patient show up in the hospital the night before, we'd go do our preoperative rounds and we write our little preoperative note and we'd see that patient that we pre-op the next day in the OR. And of course, ambulatory surgery became more of a mainstay. And in the early 90s and late 80s, that became even more popular. And of course, in the latter 90s, it even had become even more pervasive with the onset of rapid recovery pathways. And so what we're seeing is not only that shift in behavior, but also a shift in where we're doing our procedures, the site of service is changing. And the consequence of those efficiency models to reduce length of stay is that we're not seeing our patients as early upstream as we ideally would like. And so we're not getting a chance to proactively manage those patients, to manage those chronic comorbid conditions that will influence their care. So what happens? We see a patient a couple days in a pre-anesthesia testing clinic before their surgery. We make sure their name is spelled with one T, not two. We put the purple X on the left shoulder, not the right knee. And we take inventory of all their chronic medical diseases, and we say, oh, my God, you're really sick. I'm going to pass that information forward to the team that's going to see you in the OR that day. And the team that catches them in the OR that day go, oh, my God, another sick patient. I hate this, but who better to take care of this patient than me? After all, I did a fellowship in taking care of sick people. So thank God they're here, and thank God I'm their person. But lo and behold, sick people do less well than healthy people, and poorly managed sick people do less well than well-managed sick people. And we know that. We write about that. We go to warm places during cold months, and we stand on podiums, and we talk about that. And that's the paradigm, and that's terribly inadequate. And so we need to blow up that paradigm. And so that's what we can do to bake together the concept of perioperative medicine being a part of population health. We have to align those interests so that we're seeing these patients earlier in the curve, that we can improve their access to the system, we can enhance their risk stratification, and when possible, modify modifiable risk factors to improve our tracking and coordination of those patients and to be a part of the population health domain and to be a part of that population health cycle. There's a lot of things that contribute to perioperative risk. The healthcare characteristics of a patient, the patient characteristics, and the social economic. But what we can do in our space is to influence those acquired and lifestyle, if you will, modifiable risk factors. And we can do that by seeing these patients further upstream. So how do we do that? Well, we can identify them. These are some data of a study that we've done. We had a CJR program, like so many of you in your hospitals, and we made a notation of identifying people who had significant outliers from a violation of healthiness standpoint, whether or not they were anemic or poorly controlled diabetics or poorly healthy people from a nutrition standpoint or a pain management standpoint, et cetera, et cetera. And we noted that. We did that in a comparative analysis against another non-CJR participating hospital. And there was some influence just by the fact of recognizing that. But interestingly, the 14% of people who were noted to have checklist violations, risk stratifying checklist violations in the CJR hospital still only 34%, a third of them, were referred proactively to an optimization program. And although we were able to influence the length of stay and their discharge disposition to home, we didn't have an impact on their 90-day readmission or their ED visits. We can do better. So I have a saying. Between data and intention is reality. We know what the data is, and we know ideally what we want to do But then there's reality. And the reality is, if it isn't easy, it isn't going to happen. How can we make our intentions work in a way that enable us to make it happen? And that's the challenge. And that's what these next two days are going to help us, I hope, talk about. What we've done at Duke is we've just launched something called the PASS Clinic. And it's an acronym that stands for the Perioperative Anesthesia and Surgical Screening Clinic, where we're not just taking inventory of a patient's risk, But when we find that that patient has a modifiable risk factor that is not optimized, they're not ready for surgery based on our criteria, we divert them to a preoperative optimization clinic, albeit a preoperative anemia clinic or a preoperative diabetic clinic, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a specialized team fix it. We don't land planes until the wheels are down. 
Because if you do, it's likely you'll crash. Now, you can be a great pilot, and some of us are proud of the fact that we're great pilots, but the reality is even great pilots will likely not have good outcomes if you routinely land planes before the wheels are down. And so the PASS clinic is that model whereby we're identifying the planes before their wheels are down, and we're diverting them to make sure that they get optimized as best we can in these preoperative optimization clinics, and then we bring them in for the landing. And so that's a heavy lift. It takes a village. It's not just a combination of multidisciplines from the perspective of physicians and providers, but it's an institutional lift. And at Duke, I'm very, very lucky to say that there's been an investment at Duke University to enable us to have all these stakeholders to get together and create this milieu to create the PASS clinic. And the PASS clinic is just part of the overarching perioperative medicine footprint in population health. And so we're also, of course, interested in what we do in the OR. We're, of course, interested in what we do after they are discharged from the OR and how we enable their most effective and most efficient transition of care. And for that, I think perioperative medicine is population health, and I think we have a responsibility to that. Thank you. Top Med Talk. Nick Majerison here. Thank you for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, make sure you've subscribed to Top Med Talk on your podcatcher or however it is that you're listening to us at the moment, and you're spoilt for choice. We're on pretty much every single podcast platform you could think of. Uh, so make sure you've subscribed. Make sure you've engaged with us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and make sure you've signed up for our email updates on topmedtalk.com. If you get yourself there, you'll find a website that contains all of the podcasts that we've ever done, and it gives you the chance to sign up for our email updates. That way we can always get in touch with you and tell you what we're up to. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.